just start letting folks in. Good morning, folks, as you're coming in, we'll get going in just a moment here as we get everybody woven in to the webinar. Thanks for joining us this morning. We'll give it just a moment. As we get going, I just like to wait and see the numbers slow down for the number of attendees as the just takes a moment for the system to pull everybody in. Okay, I think we're here. Great, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the advisory committee uh, for Maine's Offshore Wind Roadmap. My name is David Plum and my role here along with Laura Singer um, is to facilitate um, these meetings. Uh, we are doing a Zoom webinar as our, is our usual format for the advisory committee, um, which means the folks that you see here on your screen or members of uh, the advisory committee or key staff um, that are here to support us, um, as well as we uh, are grateful for uh, representatives of our congressional de delegation. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. We're very pleased to have people uh, observe and our conversations today. I'll just note that for these meetings, uh, we don't do a public comment period, but there is a very good vehicle now on the website uh, for providing feedback to this uh, advisory committee and the overall roadmap. So I'll invite you to go to mainoffshorewind.org um, and you'll find those mechanisms there. Okay, to get us going, um, I'm gonna turn it over to one of your two co-chairs, uh, Admiral Gregory Johnson, um, to kick it off this morning. Uh, Admiral Johnson, go ahead, please. Thank you, David, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I uh, want to again thank you for particularly the advisory committee for the time and effort, but we also need to recognize the working groups. And the, they have met a lot more often and, and for a lot longer periods of time than we have in the advisory group. And they've done wonderful work as they continue to refine their recommendations uh, that uh, we're going to have to start chewing on here in the not too distant uh, future. I'd like to remind us that uh, as we get into these recommendations and everybody and every interested party has their recommendations and uh, sometimes they aren't exactly uh, all uh, mutually inclusive. And so that's why these meetings are so important as we gain information, we're ultimately going to have to make decisions. But I'd like to remind us that we need to stay at the strategic level and remember why we're here in the first place. And, that has something to do with whatever you want to call it, climbing or climate change or changing weather patterns. I spent my life on the oceans, but in a very different way than most people who uh, work in the Gulf of Maine have spent their life. But uh, it's very clear to me. And of course, all naval bases are located uh, along seacoasts. And uh, uh, we have incredible encroachment problems uh, at all of our bases particularly the largest naval base in the world, which is in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and that entire peninsula uh, has about the highest point is three feet above sea level. Uh, so you can imagine the kinds of challenges uh, that are associated there. And of course, my uh, most uh, serious addiction is fly fishing. And so in the years of just traveling around Maine and all our streams and brooks and rivers, and seeing the differences in water temperatures and the amounts of water and when lakes freeze over and when the ice, the white ice goes out, it's just been dramatic change. So whether you read the science or you're just a casual observer of nature, I think it's pretty hard to deny that something is happening, uh, which is confirmed if you wanna get into science by the report that GMRI just put out and the article in uh, Monday's uh, Portland Press Herald. So I think the work we can all see from a strategic standpoint, this work is profoundly important for the state of Maine, for the well-being of all Maine citizens, and for the both in terms of economic well-being and in terms of lifestyle well-being. So I appreciate all the interested parties who have come together. Uh, I think I've mentioned to you before how much I believe in all the years of 
both uh, in my professional life, but also in the 20 years, almost 20 years since I've been retired, working on innumerable committees over all kinds of different issues and continue to serve on boards, how critical the deliberative process is, how much better your decision-making process is when you take the time to go through those kinds of deliberations and respect it and listen and come up with uh, uh, collegial and collaborative uh, decisions that uh, are much better than what your going in position is. I have complete faith in that process and the kind of people that we have working on both on the advisory committee and all of our working groups, I have no doubt that through listening and learning, we will come up with the best possible decisions for the state of Maine or recommendations for the state of Maine. And speaking of listening and learning, uh, I'd like to draw, draw your attention to the 25th of May. There'll be more about it, but uh, thanks to Terry and Laura and Meredith and many other people, Don, uh, we're going to have that session down in Harpswell. And I would urge you all to please put that on your calendar and save it, protect it, uh, so we can all meet down there. And I think that'll be a very, very important listening and learning session coming up. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you all again. Thank you, Admiral Johnson. Wonderful. Okay, let's take a look at our agenda today. Um, and see what we want to do. We've tightened up the timing. We're going to try to do this in 90 minutes. Let's see how we do um, and give you back uh, 90 minutes of your morning, which I, I imagine many people will be grateful for. This is what we're trying to do today. We want to hear from the working group co-chairs to get some very specific updates from them. Um, so that's going to be a big piece of what we do. And then we have, the, we call it offering advice, but essentially what it is, is that you as an advisory committee now have a chance to do two things. One, help the working groups know where they should be focusing over the next few months so that you feel ready in July when we get back together to really look at final draft recommendations, that you're ready to have those conversations. So we wanna give the working group some advice today. We also want to talk a little bit about short-term priorities, things that need to be implemented now-ish, um, and offer some advice on that front. So those are two key things. That's going to be the biggest thing we're doing today. Uh, we're also going to um, have a quick presentation from Selena Cunningham from the Governor's Energy Office about the intersection of the BOEM leasing process in the Gulf of Maine with our process as a roadmap. Just to clarify, I know there's a lot of um, questions about how our process will overlap or, or sync up with what BOEM will be doing. And that's it. And then we'll say next steps and we'll talk about our steps up till July. That's all we're planning on doing today. Um, one thing I wanted to make uh, more explicit, Laura and I have talked about this a bunch, um, and that's some meeting guidelines that have been implicit and really build off what Admiral Johnson was just saying about listening to each other. But we thought it would be helpful to just be super explicit about what we should be able to expect from each other and what we think is going to be very constructive here. Three things that we thought would be helpful. One is really seek to understand viewpoints that are different than your own. We all have something to learn here. And so that is important. I know that I learn in every one of these conversations I have, whether it's with working groups or the advisory committee. So seek to understand there are things to learn together here. Um, in a similar vein, like have that openness to information and new ideas um, that for all of us is a healthy thing. And finally, uh, assume good faith, right? It's tricky right now. Um, and we come to this with different viewpoints. Um, let's for each other assume that we're all coming here to do what uh, Admiral Johnson is asking us to do, right? Which is to be wiser together. Um, so those are just three meeting guidelines we thought we'd make explicit. <clears throat> and before I go uh, turn it over to, to co-chair Dan Burgess, I just want to pause for one second. If we were in person, I'd ask for some nodding heads like, yes, David and Laura, we're okay with those meeting guidelines or, you know, this isn't working for me or there's something else. So just a quick um, check. Meeting guidelines, okay. Ground rules, we're good with them. No problem. Yep. Okay, great. And here's the tricky part. Do you guys authorize Laura and me to help you live by those? Yeah. Okay. 
Super. All right. So why don't I turn it back over um, or turn it over to Dan Burgess, director of the governor's energy office and your co-chair. Um, he's got some updates before we get into the, um, the co-chair uh, working group updates. And I'll throw the screen back up, uh, Dan, now. Yeah, thanks, David. Great to see everyone this morning. Um, I'm going to go pretty quick as we've got a package and then we've, we've got um, some limited time and just really want to provide a, an update to those that aren't kind of um, following this day to day about um, what's happening in the offshore wind space since the last time that we've met. Obviously, there's a lot happening in the world that, you know, impacted the energy situation for, you know, for Maine and the rest of the world. And so we're not going to get into any of that, but just focus on what's happening on offshore wind. So you may have seen um, uh, there was a lease sale in New York. Um, this was um, uh, six leases and went for uh, a record 4.37 billion. Um, uh, took mul multiple days uh, for this to move forward. Um, and you could kind of see it play out on the BOEM, um, BOEM website. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for why those prices were so high. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the uh, proximity to, to load centers, uh, commitment from New York around procurement and potential pipeline for future leasing, but uh, wanted to make sure that this, this group is aware of it. Um, we're also seeing uh, uh, some activity in North Carolina ar around a lease sale happening there. Um, but did want to flag this this lease lease sale that happened in New York recently. Next slide. And so the Carolina Bay leasing plans, they've announced that they're going to be uh, undertaking a lease sale in May 2020. The New York lease was a straight, um, uh, uh, did not include any sort of multi-factor bidding. Um, and uh, it looks like this lease will include uh, some workforce and supply chain development requirements, uh, not just a not just a commitment for um, uh, to, to have the lease, but there will be other requirements that come with it. Um, also, um, uh, reporting requirements with, with coordination around tribes, uh, fisheries, and um, and again, some more on the workforce related to supply chain. Next slide. Uh, New York also uh, put out a draft RFP um, uh, for um, the purchase of, of you know the energy that's going to come with it related to economic uh, uh, re related to the RECs, and so just flagging that there are economic uh, uh, benefit requirements um, that are in that draft RFP. Other things around workforce and stakeholder engagement, um, and we don't know exactly what some of the other states are uh, going to be doing in their own processes for procurement. Um, there's also active legislation done in, in Massachusetts in their legislative session related to offshore wind, and so um, some of this is still under development. Uh, last slide. But in addition to the lease sales, uh, just very quickly, there were other um, reports or efforts uh, uh, ongoing. Uh, NREL just last week put out a, or this week, uh, put out a supply chain assessment about, you know, what, what what's needed to get to the 30 gigawatt goal, which looks at um, a, a really broad summary of, of all the, all components related to offshore wind ports, vessels, number of turbines, uh, you know, um, uh, what exists for vessels, that, that type of work. Um, so th that came out and we're, we're still taking a look at that. Uh, on fisheries mitigation, BOEM is working with uh, uh, NIMPS on developing guidance related to mitigation and compensation. Um, and uh, um, RFI went out in December. And um, so we're still uh, monitoring that and, and looking at uh, BOEM's actions on that. And then finally, the National Academy of Sciences put out a uh, report on uh, radar um, used by ships and smaller vessels. And so that, that came out um, in February. And so those just wanted to provide folks an update that there are a number of different, it seems like we meet every month or two. And between those meetings, there's a whole lot of activity in the space. So just wanted to make sure that this group is aware of it. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Excellent. Okay, and just to get our brains going before we jump into the co-chair, um, the co-chair updates. Um, you know, there's a lot of activity, as uh, as Dan says, and I'd be interested if folks could just take thirty seconds, think for a moment, and say, you know, uh, this activity further south of us, how does it impact our work today? So I'd invite you all to do that. Um, 
hang on just one second. Feel free to drop it right in the chat. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate those reflections. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks everyone for dropping things in the chat. Just um, as a as a good habit, it's good to post to everyone in the chat, just like what Don uh, did that way. That means everybody can see it, including uh, folks who are observing our meeting today. I'm just gonna repost some that, that didn't make it to everybody. Okay, great. Thanks for this thinking. That's really helpful. Um, all right, so I'm just reading as you guys are probably reading as well. Um, great, yes, we have things to learn here and it's very interesting the interplay between the federal leasing process, the state influence over that and then what state has direct uh, control over. Those are interesting interplays. So in that spirit, um, let's do a quick round of um, updates from our co-chairs. And we've asked co-chairs to do um, two things for us. One is to speak about these short-term priorities, things that um, probably need to happen in the next few weeks, months. Uh, so that's one thing we've asked folks to talk about. And the other thing is just bring us up to speed about what you're really, really focusing on in your working groups right now. Uh, what really are the core conversations that are happening? And we've said no need to do any slides. We're just doing some verbal updates. And I think somewhat randomly, we'll do an order of, we'll start with environmental wildlife. We'll then go to fisheries and then go to our supply chain ports and workforce folks. And we'll end with the energy markets one. Now, Wing is, um, I just opened up his mic and Wing, uh, I know we're having a hard time getting you up into the main screen here. Uh, I think it's because uh, you're on the phone, but uh, if you unmute yourself, Wing, you should be able to talk if you're in a place. If not, we've got John Perry here as well to help out, um, to, to give us an update about the environmental and wildlife uh, working group. So uh, Wing, if you're able to, to talk, I think it's, uh, Maybe Laura, you can remind me, it's star six to unmute yourself on the phone, I think. Uh, yeah, star six. Yeah, so we'll give Wing just a second, see if you can do it. If not, John, you're gonna be on deck to, uh, to help. Oh, this is looking better. Wing, go ahead. Okay, can you guys hear me all right? We sure can. Thanks for all right, putting up with the bad tech. Yeah, um, and real uh, quick, I'm about to get some uh, coffee through dry fruit through here. So uh, let me get through this real quick. Um, uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. And uh, just real quickly on our work since we last talked, uh, initially, we're really focusing on the question of siting and how to avoid uh, siting in areas with areas of greatest conflict. And as we're moving forward now, we're thinking about sort of the, the minimization aspect of things. Um, so once a uh, project is cited, what are the uh, types of work you could do to try to minimize potential effects? Uh, so we've had some great presentations from DNV focusing on transmission work. So going from uh, the thinking about going from the wind farm itself to um, all the way to the interconnection, which includes cable landfall and the terrestrial projects uh, or terrestrial sides. So thinking about what are the 
what are the best practices to minimize uh, potential effects there? Uh, we set a baseline on what federal government's being um, requiring and um, sort of BMPs, if you will, and their guidance. We had <clears throat> Boehm give a presentation uh, to give us an understanding of their basic guidelines, which in, in short really focused on site characterization work and did not include, and there does not exist, uh, guidelines on, say, best practices for minimization and mitigation. We also heard a presentation from NYSERDA, which was really helpful to hear about their process of basically filling the gap between what uh, BOEM is requiring and uh, what uh, they felt in New York they should do, and I uh, continue to feel that there's a lot to be learned from there. Um, so with that basis, we've had a subgroup working on um, what our um, sort of the basic sort of monitoring that would be required pre and post construction and um, best practices for environmentally uh, sustainable offshore wind development. Uh, so those are ongoing and we'll be bringing those recommendations uh, to the group. We're currently editing those right now. Um, as far as media work, um, uh, GEO has uh, started a mapping process so that was based on our uh, first recommendations that came in the fall, uh, or sorry, I guess that was in the late winter. Um, and we're really focused on now on how to, um, for the state to best engage with the BOEM uh, task force, and then uh, different funding opportunities um, that may be out there on the state and federal level. So uh, hopefully that got through to you guys all. I now have my coffee um, and uh, wish you all a great day. <laughs> and I'll mute myself again. Thanks, Wing. Thanks for hanging in there and helping out. Um, John, if there's anything else you'd like to supplement with, feel free um, from that. Nope. Thanks, David. Wing hit all my bullet points. So great job. Great. Okay, super. Let's pivot over to Terry and Meredith um, and fisheries. Uh, Meredith, you going to take that on? I think so. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so the fisheries working group has also been working uh, on transmission issues similar to the environment and wildlife working group. Uh, we received many of the same briefings. We met with the environment and wildlife working group about their initial draft recommendations on these topics as well. We've been considering additional recommendations related to transmission, including how to minimize habitat, resource, and fishing activity impacts when we're citing transmission cables, as well as how to monitor them throughout the lifetime of a project. Also considering recommendations around decommissioning of uh, transmission cables. Uh, we've also been thinking about navigation and safety related issues. We received a briefing from the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, which is um, a partnership between the fishing industry and the offshore wind industry regarding a report they published on recommended aids to navigation. Um, and that was informed by a number of existing resources, but included things like turbine marking, lighting, radar, AIS on turbine bases. Um, that report was largely focused or entirely focused on fixed platform technology, however. So I think we all acknowledge that there are unique challenges associated with floating technology that will require additional consideration. Going forward, we're trying to finish drafting our recommendations over the next couple of months by working in smaller subgroups. On the two issues I already mentioned, also on two more issues, uh, one of them being accountability, such as compensation for gear loss. There are some good suggestions coming forward from working group members uh, related to that um, based on recent experiences with survey work done for the Monhegan project and that transmission cable. And finally, uh, the, the topic that we are probably um, most thorny, the most thorny issue we're dealing with is um, siting. Uh, this is one where Terry and I would really appreciate feedback from the working uh, from the advisory committee that we can bring back to the working group. This group may recall from the draft recommendations that Terry and I presented in January that the fisheries working group is considering a draft recommendation to prohibit siting of offshore wind turbines within a certain distance from shore. And um, the, in the working group, those distances have been discussed in the range of 55 to 75 nautical miles from shore. We didn't bring a specific range forward in our draft in January. And to date, the working group has not settled on a number. We've also discussed alternative approaches to the distance from shore method. Um, and those approaches might consider excluding areas of higher effort, such as lobster management area one, which where Maine alone has almost 1300 federally permitted lobster fishermen operating, as well as significant other federal fisheries operating in that area for scallops, groundfish, and herring. 
an approach like that could layer in evaluation of areas uh, beyond effort-based exclusion for things like protected or complex habitat, areas of high productivity or high effort in terms of fishing activity. So in effect, you could have a, a blanket exclusion area based on some parameter and then beyond it, more nuanced siting recommendations. Um, again, I'd ask the advisory committee when we get to the discussion portion of the agenda for your thoughts on what kind of things the fishery, fisheries working group should be taking into consideration with regard to this draft recommendation. I think that would be very helpful for us. With regard to priorities emerging that require immediate implementation, um, obviously the siting issues are important as the task force process begins again. Um, so we're glad that the mapping effort is sort of being undertaken and um, our working group had a recommendation around compiling and mapping areas of known concentration of priority species and fishing activity to inform siting. Um, we also had recommended a port access route study be conduct being be conducted that is underway now from the US Coast Guard, just initiated. Um, and then also we had a recommendation that um, the state encourage and assist BOEM in providing active and direct engagement with the fishing industry in Maine as we develop wind energy areas, um, working in partnership with a range of organizations to do that in a robust and meaningful way. So here we are, that's exactly what we're kicking off to do. I'll leave it at that, thanks. Thanks, Meredith. That's that's great, Terry. Anything else on your end that you'd want to add? And no, I think Meredith covered it all. So thank you. Great. Okay. And so let's keep that question that Meredith put out there for our discussion section. Um, and I think you know it's a clear request for some ideas from all of you. Um, let's go to uh, the super group, the supply chain, workforce development, and ports. We can start with um, supply chain. Maybe Steve, if you want to give us an update on that aspect of of that group. Sure, sure. Um, well, our focus since January really has been on uh, initiating or participating in ad hoc groups to develop and explore recommendations for co-benefits. This has been intriguing to our group. Uh, co-benefits can be port enhancements for multiple uses, funding to fisheries and environmental research, uh, new job opportunities created by the development of offshore wind. We wanna explore all of that. Uh, David has reached out to Bill Needleman in our group to start this group, but others in our working group in, who have indicated interest in co-benefits include Kirk, myself, Chris Gardner, also, uh, Maine Municipal Association and Meredith have fishery persons in mind. Uh, all others are welcome. Uh, in addition to that, we've also been focusing on proactive data collection and planning for efficiencies, trying to understand from the supply chain perspective, uh, such uh, issues as data around transmission planning, environmental data and baseline work. Uh, Parker Hadlock from our group has joined discussions on transmission planning and permitting with the Energy Markets Group and Strategies Working Group. Uh, all others are welcome. We've also uh, begun a discussion on recommendations that the state consider advocating for federal legislation to bring some of the benefits from the incredible offshore wind leasing revenue back to the states. An example of this is Senator King's report of the RISI bill. Um, we want to expand discussions to include advocating for multi-sector bidding and lease stipulations for the future Gulf of Maine offshore wind leasing. Um, and we want to see how we can bring some benefit back to the state. Um, for Immediate implementation, uh, we're working to further define Maine's goals in regional collaboration on supply chain and pursue those goals with other New England states. Uh, we've begun scoping on an innovation center, Center for Excellence, uh, with other working groups. And we also are ultimately going to identify a group to continue on post roadmap advising in this space. Anything else, Stephanie? Or anyone else? Good, That's Steve. It. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Really helpful. Um, Maria Povic, I think you're going to give us an update on uh, workforce. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to see you all. Um, 
the workforce recommendations um, have all been delivered and we are really eager to get your feedback. I will just note that thanks to Kirk Langford's connections, um, we've had some, we've had a wonderful conversation with the University of Maine's Native American Studies program to think about how we can be more inclusive of tribal populations. And I was, uh, I, I was so impressed by all the things they have cooking with youth and um, STEM, and then also um, working with Native American students on the undergraduate and graduate research levels. Um, and there's some overlap there with Habib and his work. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled. And if anybody else has any relationships there with um, Darren Ranko or other folks in the Amer Native American Studies program, um, let's connect because I think, um, you know, the workforce group really identified um, this population as one that we had not yet connected with very um, deeply. And so this was a chance to explore further. So those are the big updates. And I'll be headed to Maine Maritime Academy tomorrow um, to meet with those folks. I'm excited about that. Super. Thanks, Maria. That's great. Uh, Matt Burns, you want to give us an update on ports? Yeah, sure. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Apologize for my husky voice this morning. I have come down with something here. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, really the, the big announcement um, that I have to share, I guess, with the advisory committee this morning is that DOT has uh, uh, started the uh, Offshore Wind Port Advisory Group, the OSWPAG. Um, so that's that, um, that stakeholder group that I had mentioned that would be uh, created here over the the last several months, hang on one second, honey. Um, so basically that, that group has been, uh, has been created. Um, the purpose of the group is to advise Maine DOT on pot uh, potential development of offshore wind facilities. Um, it'll create a forum for robust stakeholder and public engagement. There'll be 19 members uh, of the group. Uh, the first meeting will be scheduled sometime later in April. Um, there is a, a, a actually like a website where you can um, go for the latest information and updates about the group. Um, I think, David, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a way we can kind of blast that out to the group. Um, but, you know, if not to uh, feel free to give me a call if you have any questions, but um, you can definitely make sure that everybody is aware of that information. Uh, the group is open to public participation. And uh, like I said, if, there, if there's any uh, questions or anything, you can feel free to give me a call. We can touch base offline, but the group's intended to be a companion to the main offshore wind initiative. So as that group uh, continues to meet um, and, and when information comes from that group, I'll be happy to you know, provide updates and information to the advisory committee and the, and the working groups. And then um, the only other update I had, uh, Meredith kind of touched on it, but the port access route study uh, that's a significant development uh, from our federal partners with the Coast Guard. So we'll be participating in that and, and plugged into that study, providing information and comments uh, as it pertains to, you know, navigation safety here at Maine's ports. So um, if anybody has any questions about that, also feel free to, to give me a call and we can talk through that. Um, but, but that's really the, the, the most uh, substantive updates that I have, David. Super. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. I tried to drop a link in there. Yes, Hannah, thank you for awesome. putting a better one in. Uh, sometimes when I cop it out of emails, it gets you sideways. But yes, the, the announcement was on uh, March 25th. You can find it on the DOT's website. It has more details about what Matt is saying. And it's, it's exciting to see that stakeholder work um, get going. Okay, I'll just do a quick note. Jonathan Poole, who uh, had been a co-chair with Matt um, and Steve, in this group has uh, moved on to a new job. Uh, and so um, Maria has stepped in to help uh, carry the torch on, on workforce issues uh, in Maria's and Hannah Pingree's office in the governor's office of policy innovation in the future. Um, we are looking, uh, Geo's looking to, to help fill uh, Jonathan's shoes as we go forward. Okay, so we still have one more working group and that is energy markets and strategy. Um, and there we have Selena Cunningham from GEO who'll give us an update. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. So we have been working with um, our contractor DNV since uh, for a number of months. And I think over the course of the next month or so, 
we'll continue to kind of refine and hopefully finalize some of the products that will be really important for the work of our working group as well as for the entire roadmap process. And that includes um, the energy needs assessment, um, which uh, will have an, in draft form um, next month, as well as the socioeconomic analysis that we have been working on um, that uh, there have been ongoing interviews that DNV has been conducting to help uh, build out the qualitative components of that analysis. And uh, we wanna make sure that that's all included as we um, work to finalize the, the analysis. Um, we are also um, getting a, a, a document related to procurement strategies. What is the best way to um, procure uh, offshore wind in a way that is beneficial for the state um, and cost effective? And so we'll use that those tools to help refine our existing recommendations. In terms of the recommendations that we have, we have one related to setting a procurement target and a process for procurement. Second is working to make sure that offshore wind is cost effective for the state of Maine. And third is related to supporting um, efforts to ensure regional collaboration. We as a group really need to focus on uh, coming up with practic with specific components of how we're going to deliver on those recommendations. Some of that will be immediate steps and then others will be much longer term. Um, and so we'll we'll continue embarking on that in the next couple of months. Um, in the in the short term, we're also going to we started the process of, of having a subgroup looking at transmission similar to the other some of the other working groups. From a um, project development standpoint, there's an interest in in figuring out how to de-risk transmission. So we want to have that conversation about how to do that. Also being mindful of the interests and focus of the other working groups. So that's an ongoing kind of discussion that we're having. Um, as a working group, and we'll we'll want to figure out how to cross pollinate with other um, working groups, and then um, I think that those are the the kind of key areas that we are we are focusing on. And then I just think that on the regional collaboration, there's a lot of opportunity we can learn from what's being done, as we've talked about in in the past, but in other areas um, also, as Dan mentioned. In Massachusetts, um, they're looking at procurement. And so when we think about our specific strategies, how can we be um, build on those and partner with other states as we think about our own plan? So unless um, anyone has anything to add, that's that's it from the Energy Working Group. Great. OK. Thanks, Selena. All right. Um, great. I think that's it from a round of updates. And I think what we want to do is pivot now into a discussion around that. And Laura is going to lead us in that. Um, and Laura, I was taking notes on some of those immediate priorities. So I'm, well, I'm happy to share that when you're ready for that. Um, I'm also happy to put up slides when you, if you want a timeline slide. So let me turn it over to you, Laura, to um, guide us in this discussion. Great. Good morning, everybody. Wow, um, that is a lot, a lot of work that's been accomplished. I think um, I think someone mentioned earlier this morning, I think it was Stephanie, that this is meeting maybe number 50 of the main offshore um, wind roadmap effort. So um, lots of meetings, lots of conversations and lots of great work. We just wanted to find, um, take a fir first, just take five minutes um, to sort of get a temperature check of some of the short-term priorities you just heard. You know, which ones resonated with you? Um, are they headed in the right direction? Um, and we don't have a lot of time because we've, you know, kept this agenda short, but if you, we have you know, a few months now for the working groups to finish up their work. And um, we wanna make sure we're giving them enough guidance from the advisory committee on the, the type of work that they should um, be doing to answer the key questions. They laid out some things. I think um, David was gonna put some of those in the chat. And we just wanna get a sense from you, either a thumbs up, thumbs down, um, or anything in the comments as we pause and sort of say, okay, yep, is there, their head in the right direction or is there something that was really missing that you want to make sure that the working groups talk about or dig into in the next couple of months headed towards our July meeting, right? Where all the working group recommendations will come together and we'll have to do some um, good work there in terms of bringing everything together. So I'm just going to pause for a second to see if there's anything that's either missing and I see Tom putting his hand up. Um, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a very hard question to answer because 
there are a lot of recommendations going in a lot of different directions. And thinking in terms of this overall effort, the role of the advisory group as a group to present in a coherent fashion something to the energy office and ultimately the legislature uh, for them to act on. One thought that, uh, that, that has occurred to me sort of throughout the process is there, there ought to be a better way of categorizing and organizing the various recommendations so that we can evaluate um, what we ought to be doing near term and long term. And I, I can think of a couple of ways of doing that uh, and probably you should do it both these ways. One of them is to categorize recommendations by things that Maine has power over and things that Maine does not have power over. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in, in one category would be legislation dealing with transmission siting. In, in another category would be how do you get regional coordination and how do you get uh, the feds to behave appropriately with respect to our offshore waters? So that's one division. I think another division are and there are sort of subcategories within there, for example, for things over which Maine has authority, who has it? Uh, does it require legislation? Can it be done by uh, the energy office? Um, can it just, you know, can be done some other way? And then a second way of, of dividing things uh, is basically critical path timelines. Um, what has to happen before something else happens? And for example, uh, one of the recommendations is to gather more information about impacts on fisheries with respect to particular sites. That has to happen before you can make a coherent recommendation to the feds as to what they should do about it. So organizing uh, recommendations in terms of what has to happen before something else, I think makes a lot of sense. I frankly would not spend a lot of time trying to figure out which recommendations are most important because that is going to be uh, impenetrably controversial <laughs> because different people are going to have different views. So I would sort of leave that to, in effect, the ultimate decision makers. But at least those first two kinds of categorizations, I think, would be very useful if the working groups can sort of each organize their recommendations in those kinds of categories. That will make it easier to bring it together uh, for the ultimate product that's going to go to GEO. Great, good, good thoughts and good feedback for the working groups. Um, Admiral. Yeah, I'd just like to jump on what uh, Tom said. <clears throat> and uh, uh, first of all, there's a lot that Maine has no control over, so we ought to differentiate that. Uh, I completely agree. And then, of course, who, if of those things that Maine has power over or authority over, who is the accountable party and what needs to be done. And the whole thing about sequencing is uh, critically important. And uh, if you do all of those things, then rank ordering our various recommendations. I don't think that's anything we have to do. We just need to make sure we get all the right stuff in there that needs to be considered and then who's accountable for it. Uh, I think that'll really do two things. It'll make our job much easier it gives us some kind of a coherent overall structure. And I've been thinking about this too, but I wasn't smart enough to come up with the kind of nice recommendation Tom did. But I think that's profoundly important as we go forward from here. And as we try to tee ourselves up for the, what is it, July 20th meeting, I think that would be a very good way to structure uh, that upcoming meeting. Great. Thanks for that feedback. Are there any, um, when you look at those immediate priorities, can I just get it like, are those the, are, are those the areas, the topic areas that you think, are there, is there any topic area that's not covered that we want to give guidance? And then um, we'll pivot and actually spend a few minutes directly um, answering Meredith's question that she asked uh, regarding the fisheries working group and the things that they're struggling with in the next couple months. But are there any, um, can I just get a quick thumbs up? Yep, they're headed in the right direction. Or no, there's there's some big holes that we think that they should try to grapple with in the next couple of months. Don. Oh, there you are. <laughs> so I um, appreciate everybody's work on this. I actually have a, some kind of a, a few kind of specific narrow comments. Um, one is that it seems like um, you know, moving the mapping process along absolutely as quickly as possible, 
and clarifying the, mitig the mitigation framework as soon as possible is, is just, it, you know, those things, understanding those things should happen first. And they're each hard things to wrestle with. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice that they're on Boehm's agenda, but it doesn't mean they're gonna get to it or get to it in a way that would be helpful to us. So I, I, I think, I just think that's critical. Second is, uh, um, the how the kind of game plays out if we establish uh, you know a, 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 a 50 or 75 mile um, uh, perimeter or try to establish that uh, in some fashion um, and then what does New Hampshire what do New Hampshire and Massachusetts do uh, regarding that question uh, and and what are kind of the geopolitics of, of cable going ashore across the three states coasts? Um, getting, getting as clear a vision of those variables, I think is just important. And I, they're obviously in some ways, they're very difficult to, to, to get a beat on, but to, to be, pers well, we just need to be thinking about how, how this plays out uh, across the entire Gulf of Maine and not just um, you know, kind of literally directly off our shore. A um, couple very spe specific comments. Um, I, pres I presume that the, the environmental and fisheries discussions are thinking about the, the potential impact of climate change, warming ocean, et cetera, on critical habitat. Um, but that question of, you know, the potential shift of, of, of species of concern into into areas that might today look less impacted, uh, you know that that that's a very difficult thing to get a handle on. But I think it merits some attention. Uh, and then, lastly, back to the ben, you know, the the kind of co-benefits um, that Steve was identifying. Um, I think another co-benefit that ought to be identified and and characterized, if possible, is what are the working waterfront investment needs uh, along this coast. Um, and how might those be addressed uh, in the course of this scale of economic transactions? Um, uh, because if you you know if you if you look at lo potential location and then look at you know who, the benefits and impacts, the benefits are to the investors, the company, the developers, and perhaps to the community where a cable comes ashore. Um, there's a lot of there's not there's not much benefit to to smaller fishing communities up and down the coast. And so how you spread those benefits out is, is really a central question. And, and you know, we've got a, we've got a waterfront that's, that's grappling with intense real estate development and whatnot. And that, that, that collateral benefit ought to be identified and, and quantified uh, uh, as a factor to be thinking about. Thank you. No, those are all um, great, great thoughts. Um, in terms of the mitigation framework, can you define what you what you mean when you use the term mitigation, Don? Um, so I, I'm thinking narrowly about the impact on the fishing community when I raise it, but I think it's just just more broadly. It's you know to you know I realize the the, the world is not an, uh, a well ordered uh, place, but to have a clear understanding about you know when you when you're when you're making a decision either as a in a regulatory body or as a, a potential opponent or supporter, um, having a clear definition of what the mitigation steps and values are going to be out front, as opposed to they get negotiated at the end in order to you know get a positive decision. Those are two very different processes and. Um, um, and I would just encourage that the mitigation thinking be advanced as quickly as possible. Um, and the regional framework, you know, is something that I've heard all the working groups really, you know, talk about and grapple with. And certainly as the, the Gulf of Maine um, task force process is under is underway, um, those conversations will continue and are extremely important, obviously. Admiral. On the, in the spirit of 
li uh, listening and learning. Uh, Don, on your very first point about mapping and medi mitigation, I presume you, when you say mapping, you meant in the sense of usage. Where, where does where does activity actually happen? Fishing take place. Good data on that, and then mitigation strategies to support or protect those areas, or if there's encroachment in those areas, when you say mitigation, is that what, you, is you, do you mean compensation? Yeah, I compensate? think, I, I think, yes, I think ultimately one of the outcomes is compensation and um, just, you know, these things need to be worked on beforehand rather than, you know, in the, in the last minute scurry when people are trying to get a positive agreement and it gets squeezed out in a negotiation. Yeah. I totally agree with that. In some place in the earlier brief, I think it may have been Dan's brief, the uh, MM and MFS, the, I think there was a sub of one of the bullets you had, Dan, that talked about mitigation and compensation plans. Is that is that right? Is that happening? Yeah, and I, I would um, need Selena or Meredith or someone to provide the details on it, but there's some some activity. Yeah, BOEM is developing draft guidance on fisheries mitigation and compensation strategies. Um, I think the the timeline for what they're trying to do is really um, being driven by the development of some new projects in southern New England. And so how much they'll get to uh, is still unclear. I think they're focusing more on the compensation side um, because of, of the timeline. I, I agree with your point. Dan, I think it's much better to do it proactively than come up with all our recommendations and then reactively try to figure out how we're doing it. I think that'll make the whole process work a whole lot better. Um, Suzanne, I'll, I'll let you go. And then I would like to make sure we can pivot now to really addressing the, the mapping question that um, Meredith and the Fisheries Working Group have. And we do have a slide on that um, if we wanna talk about that a little further. Go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, sure. Thanks. I'll be brief. I just um, did want to say that those last two comments, you know, Don's comments and um, Craig's comments have to me really point to this idea of how do we pivot from the reactive to the proactive. And I think, you know, in a lot of instances, there's the state and federal process and what they need to do and what they're going to do. A lot of this is specific to particular lease site areas, to particular projects that are proposed. And so, you know, it's it's sort of outside of the regulatory process. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I think the more that as as a state or a broader community of all of us here, you know, to what extent can we prompt that more proactive thinking around how does this fit into our coastline? How does this fit into our state? Um, it's a tall order for this particular process to take that on, but just pointing to the more that we can pivot from just sort of responding to each individual proposal and each you know, particular dynamic of where things run ashore in, into a community, um, I think the better off we're gonna be. And so I just think, you know, for, for folks like, you know, where I work at the Island Institute, what Don is doing, you know, I think to the extent that we can bring the resources to places that are likely to be and to individuals who are likely to be affected to try to, look uh you know to look for these opportunities instead of respond to them um i i think the, the better off we can be so just wanted to say that really resonates with me and i'm going to go off a of video again because i saw you frozen up yes um great well that was a really interesting and good conversation i think for the for the advisory committee to begin thinking about uh, appreciate everyone raising hey, Laura, could i make a quick comment oh absolutely i see okay yes wing i'm sorry guys um I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that was said um, about what we can and cannot do or, or have say over. And I think we need to think about uh, recommendations in terms of when power may be coming ashore to Maine and when it may not be, because a project cited in exactly the same location could have power going to multiple states um, and that is not Maine. So I think as we think about our recommendations and think about how we have, the state has, um, a voice in what's happening in waters adjacent to us, we do need to think about how, our, uh, how we're able to engage on projects um, when power is coming ashore to the state, which we could then engage through power purchase agreements and other discussions. And then how might we have discussions for projects that where power is not coming ashore in Maine? Uh, because 
the ability then to uh, have a direct conversation starts to change um, and we may get limited to CZMA type um, engagement. So just to reflecting back on um, Don's and Tom's comments and others. Thank you. Thanks, Wing, and, th and thanks for jumping in there. Terry. Yeah, well, I, th I think we really need to bear in mind uh, the positioning of these things. Uh, if you go to a different state, Regionally, if you go to Massachusetts or uh, New Hampshire, that cable going ashore is going to be a whole lot longer than it is. Uh, and I don't know if that's relevant to uh, the, the people that are developing these, but I think it is. It, it would be a huge cost to them to go to a different state. So, um, you know, Maine kind of has an advantage uh, if we stay within a, a certain a certain area along the coast of Maine uh, to bring that stuff ashore in Maine and have and have more of a say over. I think right now, you know. So. Interesting thoughts, yeah. And I think there is something to be learned from what DMV has done in terms of transmission and where the workload is and how ISO New England um, fits in because all our electricity right goes into one electrical grid. Um. So Meredith did pose that question that they're struggling with in terms of what should the consideration should the fisheries working group keep in mind as it starts to continue to talk about, and this is part of actually the mapping exercise, the questions of how is there a, a, a limit offshore? And that's something that they haven't, they're wrestling with, they haven't come to a conclusion on and just wanted a sense of, are there um, thoughts that the advisory committee would have for that fisheries working group? Whether it's the, the, the pros and the cons or the things to just think about um, in terms of a recommendation, in terms of uh, offshore, where a limit might be. Go ahead, David. I heard, I heard Don Perkins say in that conversation you should try to get as good as information as possible about the behavior of other states, right? How other states would react in different scenarios. And also the cabling question that Terry brings up, like what really is, you know, a likely industry scenario and maybe DNV or others could help with that. Um, so that's what I heard from Dawn is like, get that information because that will inform the way you think about Maine's actions. Am I paraphrasing you correctly, Don, on that? Yeah. Hang on a second, Don. You still you're still on mute. Yeah. There's, there's obviously a, a lot of factors moving here. It's not just a these aren't binary questions. But so let's just let's just think for a minute for the Maine New Hampshire border, and and you know Boehm's going to be the arbiter of, of a process and other federal agencies. And so if, if we have an exclusion zone that goes out 75 miles and New Hampshire doesn't, then, then Terry's point about the distance of a cable uh, starts to, to move. Um, you, know, um, you know, New Hampshire could, well, I don't need to explain why. You know, you've got, you've got you, could, you could locate within, you know, theoretically closer to, to to the New Hampshire or North, or North Shore of Massachusetts, then the question is, do you get, you, you, you probably driven outside of Jeffries. Um, but I, 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 there's just a lot of dynamics about what the, the kind of unintended consequences of a hard exclusion zone. And I don't, I don't raise this to argue against the exclusion zone, but it, the, We've got to think through the the potential un, unintended consequences of an exclusion zone really carefully. Um, Terry, and then and then Meredith. Yeah. So so just thinking about this discussion we've been having at the at the working group. Um, you know, we got this mapping exercise going on now that we won't have the answer to until. October, maybe September, October, if we're lucky. Uh, so we won't know what the activities are in a lot of the Gulf of Maine uh, until that point, for sure. You know, we couldn't have, we aren't going to have those laid out on a map. 
for us to look at and say, okay, too much, there's too much going on in this area. We should move it east of here or whatever. Um, so it kind of handicaps uh, the work that we're trying to do. And I, and I understand that, uh, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, so we need to move forward with the, with what we have for information now. And according to the information that we have now, you know, uh, you know, I'd say a good 80% of the activity in the Gulf of Maine is within a certain distance of shore. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of management area one within that area. Um, and that area is really, really precious to the state of Maine. I mean, you know, 700 and something million dollars worth of uh, lobsters got landed here last year. So, uh, and each one of those, you know, feeds two or three, four fa families, you know, along the coast of Maine. Um, so, and as we're talking about, you know, developing these ports and we want, we, you know, if we want to go ahead with developing these ports, we also got to bear in mind the cost that is going to come to each one of these small communities with these small businesses in them. And uh, I, you know, so it, it's, it's hard for us to come up with an, an exact number. Uh, you know, I, I put a proposal out in front of the working group uh, thinking, you know, it would, it would eliminate 80% of the, the traffic. And then we'd have 20% of the people to work with to, to make sure that uh, they're, you're able to place these things in areas that aren't important not only to them, but to the fish, the, the fish in the environment that the fish grow up in on the bottom of the ocean, you know, and there's a reason why, you know, people always think, oh, you can just go over here and catch fish. Well, that's not true. I mean, there's a reason why those fish are in that area. The reason is they like that area because of its temperature, because of its uh, ecology, you know, the makeup of the water, whatever it is. There's a reason those fish are there, and, and they're just not fish everywhere in the ocean, and there aren't lobsters everywhere in the ocean. Um, so we just got to be mindful of that as, as we move forward. And, and so I think the easiest way to approach it is to make, make it not be uh, tempting for somebody else, for the, one of the developers to go to somebody else and look another state, but also be bearing in mind the, the cost that it's going to be to the coast of Maine. So, right. So there are multiple factors to really think about how to de-risk the project and de-conflict it without making um, it seem as though it's not possible for something to happen in Maine or for Maine, which I think is what Don was saying. Merida. Yeah, I'll be quick. I just wanted to say, I mean, for people who may not be familiar with what this map might look like, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a visual handy, but um, 55 to 75 nautical miles excludes a good portion of the Gulf of Maine. Uh, it really starts to push, you know, beyond that area, you're, you're pushing pretty far south towards the coast of Massachusetts off of Cape Cod. And I think that's important for people to understand. Um, I guess the other thing is, I think we're struggling um, in the working group's discussions with thinking about how, you know, are we, if we go that route, are we saying the whole area is important and therefore we're not distinguishing a more nuanced perspective of what's important um, because obviously Maine, you know, we can make this recommendation, but we, we can't control what happens in federal waters. So that's just one piece I wanted to put out for people's consideration. Great. Well, obviously I know the fisheries working group is thinking really hard about what are the implications and what would it mean to have a recommendation like that? I appreciate you guys from the advisory committee. Don, do you wanna uh, weigh in one more time here and then we'll move to a little exercise to sort of make sure we're leaning into the right questions. Go ahead, Don. Follow-up question for, for Meredith or, or Terry. Are you thinking about the, this exclusion? So if, if we think about zone zone one and, and think about how it extends off of New Hampshire and the North shore of Massachusetts, are, are you thinking about this narrowly as a as a state strategy about, about an exclusion zone? Or are you thinking about it as a zone one strategy that we'd pursue politically 
at the federal level a, a, across its entire, you know, Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts uh, geography. I don't know that there's a lot of clarity about that, Don. I mean, I think um, I, I think the, but I think to to sort of your bigger picture question, I think the working group's thought is make a recommendation that the state is advancing, right? So that's sort of why we're seeking feedback from the advisory committee here, because this would be something that the state would need to carry forward into the BOEM task force process. And so, um, yeah, there are there are potential implications for further the southern, you know, for the southern half of the Gulf of Maine as well. So my, right. my, my strong suggestion would be to think about, you know, advancing that as a, as a Gulf of Maine issue as opposed to a main issue and, and covering the the New Hampshire shore and the, the north the north shore of Massachusetts because I, I think otherwise there are just unintended consequences of a main zone versus New Hampshire Massachusetts zones that we just can't begin to imagine. Terry, do you have something critical? Yes. So, yeah. so if you if you looked at my proposal, Dawn. Uh, and I don't have a copy of it, so I can't show it to you, but uh, Meredith, Meredith had it drawn on a map anyway. Um, it, go, it comes down along, so the exclusion zone would be around uh, New Hampshire and the North Shore of Massachusetts too. So it takes in all the way down to uh, New Ledge, goes south of New Ledge down to the 4220 line, down to the George's Bank area management so it does we we did think about that selena it's it's helpful to hear different perspectives about this and i i i think that the mapping process will be very helpful in terms of how we should pursue this as a state because what i want to make sure that we're doing is protecting the areas that are of highest important or big uh, highest risk as opposed to specific distances and specific distances in some instances might be appropriate, but I just get concerned about us getting ahead of understanding all of the data that might be helpful to inform that decision. And then I just say, I think that other states might have very different perspectives about how far they may be interested in having pro uh, projects off their shore. And as we think about whether or not we are going to be procuring, assuming that we are going to be procuring offshore wind, there is a cost obviously to that distance. And so there has to be some balance to that understanding. We wanna put these in the right place. Don't wanna build them, build them in the wrong places, but things that we wanna kind of think through um, with some um, data to support it. So those are just a, a few thoughts. Thanks, Lena. And Hannah, I'm gonna give you a last word and then I'm gonna turn it to David to share, share us how to do a Jamboard. Jamboard, that sounds way more exciting. I hate Doesn't that sound cool? Yeah. Um, uh, Selena actually just said it, well, I guess my question for the working group um, and thinking about the mapping exercise is just some greater understanding of what's happening in other parts of the world and country. I mean, 50 to 70 miles, the, I get, guess the question is, is, is anything still viable that far out from an economic um, perspective? So, I mean, obviously we, I think that Terry's points and, and Selena's points about the right spots and considering the most valuable uh, fishing territory is essential. I'm just, I don't have a, um, I'm not an expert in offshore wind. So just understanding, is there anywhere else in the world that far out? And is it still economically viable at that, at that distance? Yeah, lots of factors to, to, to play in. Um, so an ongoing conversation, really appreciate everyone leaning in a little bit to this. And Don, I mean, David, I'm going to turn it over to you for the Jamboard. Okay. Yeah, so we thought as a way to sort of wrap this up, um, we've talked a little bit about immediate priorities that we need to implement in the next couple of months, like this mapping exercise and some other things. That was the intention of the immediate priorities, like what really needs to be implemented. At the same time, there's an opportunity for the working groups to help all of you prepare to have your big conversation in July, when you're going to look at sort of the final drafts come, coming out of the working groups and try to make sense of it all and help GEO turn that into a roadmap. And so what I'd like to do um, is um, just quickly have you all think about what you would like to um, have the working groups 
uh, prepare for you in July, assuming it's a, uh, a reasonable request. And this is an opportunity for you all to actually get involved in writing here. I just dropped, and I did this just to the folks who are panelists, just to the folks who are um, on the council. I didn't drop this chat to, to the members of the public, but you can watch what's happening if you're a member of the public. So what we wanna do, and let's just literally take two minutes to do this because we're running a little late, but you've got the working group co-chairs ears right now, right? In this group, because the working group co-chairs are here with you. If you wanted to say, hey, co-chairs, I'd really like you guys to help us um, get ready to answer this question in July. What would that be? And I've put a few things up that I've heard so far, like Don Perkins and said a couple things, um, you know, around co-benefits. We really need to get clear about what those needs are, how they're distributed along the coast. That would be helpful as we're thinking about co-benefits and the way those figure into the roadmap. Um, Don also mentioned, you know, environmental and wildlife folks, if you haven't done it already, you really need to be thinking about the way climate change might be shifting species distribution and the impacts that that has on what you're saying. And then um, Suzanne mentioned, you know, in recommendations, the most exciting thing for us to do is to be shifting towards proactive things as opposed to reactive scrambling to, to, to address something when it comes up. So these are a few things that I heard you all say already. The way you do this, see where my cursor is right here? This is a little um, sticky note. And you all can click on that, type what you want. Just go ahead and put your initials after it um, so that we know who's saying what. And you click Save. It'll pop up here. Um, and then you can move it to where you want, OK? So this is an opportunity to give a signal to your co-chairs, your working group co-chairs, um, this, you know, these are the conversations that would be really helpful to have some more data on when we get into July, right? These would be great conversations um, for us to have in July, and please help us prep to do that. Okay, so let me give folks a moment to do it. If this is stymieing you in terms of the technology of it, just shout, open up your mic and shout it out, and Samanish and I and Laura, we can make sure we, you get your stuff in there or drop it in the chat and we'll paste it in here if this is problematic. But this is an opportunity. We need to think about what we'll be doing in July, right? In July, we're gonna be taking all this and trying to make sense of it. Uh, and even if we do what Tom urges us to do, Tom Welch urges us to do to organize things more orderly, we do need to get more information for us to have some powerful conversations in July. So any other thoughts here, feel free to drop it in the chat if it's not working to do it on the Jamboard. We'll just let this work for a sec. Don, if you think I mischaracterize your pieces, please fix them or, or just let me know. And remember to put your name or initials. Yes, please. because while the anonymous duck looks good, it actually doesn't tell us who you are. Does anybody need more time or are we feeling like we've kind of done everything we can do here? David, I, I, um, just to throw one in that I can't seem to get direct access to the gym board. Um, Okay, I think kind of best best available information about uh, exclusion zone uh, exclusion zones around wind farms or around individual turbines uh, and how policy and thinking around exclusion zones is is evolving around the world. Great. Anything else like that, folks? Uh, James got, has one in the uh, chat there. Do you want me to put that in there? Please. I'm going to test my Jamboard skills here. That's right. All right. David, I think uh, this is Terry. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I think that uh, Dawn's point about co-benefits to the, to everyone, to the fishing communities and, and to uh, the regular ratepayers in the state of Maine are, are very important things to take into consideration here. So, yeah. Great. So maybe more about the cost implications, Terry. Yeah, I think so. Cost benefit analysis or whatever you want to call it. And I just did a quick one on that, Laura. Okay, great. Okay, so great. We're seeing a few things. Let's let's leave it here because um, we want to hear from Selena uh, with a little more detail on how how our process could intersect with the with BOEM. Um, but these are some ideas that would make our conversation easier in July. We'll say a little bit about next steps when we finish up. We will have some conversations before we get to July, but July really is an important milestone for us. Okay, feel free to keep working on this while we while we move to the next thing. Thanks, everybody. This has been really interesting. Um, Selena, do you, uh, I can lift up slides for you um, so that uh, you can walk us through some thoughts you have on, on the, the bone process. Thanks, that'd be great. So I'm gonna share a few slides that walk through um, the bone process so that you um, have some general information. Um, I just start generally that the roadmap process has really been uh, informative for GEO and I assume other state agencies to understand where the areas of interest and priorities are. And that will, um, from a general perspective, I think something that we will strongly carry forward in any conversations that we have with BOEM, and it already is, um, in terms of how we feel about the need to, for transparency, stakeholder engagement, and opportunities for people to um, understand the process, be part of the process, and clearly understand where they can help influence the process. So just as a refresher, I wanna make sure that people understand what the Gulf of Maine task force is and what is happening in the um, shorter and longer term with the task force. So in October of um, last year, the Biden administration announced its goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 and uh, announced a targeted uh, lease sale in the Gulf of Maine by, uh, pardon the typo there, uh, by 2024. And you can see that it's on that bottom line there. It's the last lease sale in there series of seven lease sales that are upcoming in this um, administration. Okay, next slide, please. BOEM creates uh, task forces to help inform um, their decision-making, to share information and um, collect information from federal, state, and local um, government entities. And in uh, 2019, uh, the Gulf of Maine um, task force met once. The, uh, now that this announcement came out from the administration, the task force is starting to uh, come alive again to help support the decisions related to commercial leasing for the Gulf of Maine. We anticipate that the first meeting will be, the next meeting will be in, um, in May, um, likely the 19th, it's tentatively scheduled for the 19th. Um, and at that meeting, probably be a re refresher of the bone process, talk about the commercial leasing process, and we'll also talk about the main research lease application that the state has submitted. Next slide. In terms of what to anticipate in the next year or so, or year, uh, years, year and a half, um, is the, the overall beginning stages of the leasing process from request for information all the way to project development um, and installation. And this will vary uh, dramatically depending on where you are um, in the, on the coast. But if you go to the next slide, David, just wanna zero in on that first section there. So. The um, BOEM can hold a, and can issue requests for information to get information about um, interest from developers, interest in concern or uh, areas and data from an environmental fisheries, um, navigation, cultural, uh, different, different data sources that would be helpful as they to inform their leasing process. There will be public comment periods. Um, they'll, they'll also go out with a, a call for information. Um, as well as do an uh, environmental assessment on that work. And this is just general slides to outline the BOEM process. None of this is specific to the Gulf of Maine. They have not yet announced their specific strategy for the Gulf of Maine, but just wanted to give you a sense of what their options are related to leasing. Next slide. And generally they go through a winnowing process of identifying a larger area, 
And then if you wanna just quickly go through the next slides and keep on going. So it goes, it can go start with an R request for information. Then they develop a smaller call area. Then they do a wind energy area. And then within that, do they do a um, lease areas and then hold an auction for specific leases and then uh, go through a separate process for the developer to then plan um, a project, um, go through additional NEPA on that plan. And then they can, if approved, build and develop that project. Um, next slide. All right, uh, next slide. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So we've talked about the mapping project um, already, so I won't go into detail here, but I think that this information will really be helpful from a state perspective to understand where those areas of greatest concern are as we start this initial winnowing process um, through the BOEM task force. And what I think um, at, at GEO, we are coordinating with other state agencies and our priority will be to share information with the advisor committee working groups and the public about what the BOEM process is, understand the views of um, our interested parties and stakeholders, and so that we can best represent um, the state um, as we work uh, with BOEM as a member of the task force. So that's a quick overview. Um, happy to answer any questions um, or provide more information out offline as well, knowing that we just have a few minutes here. Thanks so much, Selena. That's really helpful. Um, so. Are there any questions for Selena about what's happening and how our process can help inform this federal process? Any quick thoughts? We have just a couple minutes here, so feel free if you have a question or a, a suggestion. Admiral Johnson, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think it's a, you know, a statement of the obvious, but it seems like the data that we need to move our process forward is all data that can be very helpful to inform the bone process. So the more good data we get and insight and the things that are gonna be beneficial to us here in Maine uh, well, is also gonna be very be beneficial to inform the bone process. So I think it's all a win-win. And the more we can get done, the more proactive we can be uh, I think the more effectively we can impact uh, in a positive way, beneficial to the state of Maine, uh, the bone process. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, I was just going to add to that. Yeah, the, I, the that we've done the amount of work that's happened or that we've reviewed over the last hour and a half is going to be really helpful in those conversations and ident and identifying where there's gaps where we need to do more. Um, and I think both through this process and other processes, the fact that um, there has been avenues for stakeholder en engagement and participation in these processes, I think will really help. Um, you know, it's gonna be, we need to be really clear about what the roadmap is and how it differs from the process that BOEM runs, but I think it's gonna be really helpful in informing that process. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, Wing? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think the process going forward will be different than the past, but in the past, the BOEM process was, it was very difficult for stakeholders to engage meaningfully in that process. And I think as we think about our recommendations, um, once that uh, process starts, how can this group and other stakeholders in Maine continue to have a clear avenue of engagement in that through um, the state offices? Thanks, Wayne. Right. Because we have a horizon on the roadmap, and the bone process is going to go beyond that horizon, right? So, what it, what are those pathways? Great, Don. Again, the continuing the process of stating the obvious. Um, it, given that bone is you know the arena, um, it's going to be really important to hear from those of you that are you know, playing leadership roles within state government about what, what your political strategy is going to be, uh, you know, kind of running parallel in, in interacting with the BOEM process. Um, if, if we simply, you know, kind of observe the BOEM process and participate narrowly as one can participate, I, I, you know, our, our, our opportunity to get our concerns addressed is going to be, is going to be limited. And so I think the political strategy that the state uh, plans on playing out is really central. And you know, 
figuring out how to share that perspective, which may or may not be the you know easy to do given the nature of political strategy. You want to be quiet about it, but that I I, I think that's the central question here that's going to be important to to somehow understand. Thanks, Don. Hannah, you've got your hand up. I'm not sure it was to answer Don's question, but uh, go ahead, please. Don't, I don't think I can answer Don's question, but thank you for the question, Don. Um, I mean, I think I was actually just going to really highlight um, James Gilway's comment. I mean, I, I do think, honestly, we even need to better understand New Hampshire and Massachusetts engagement in, in a lot of the different discussions that we are having. And I think um, I mean, we have certainly connections in some of these other states, but I actually think um, in a variety of the working groups trying to understand uh, how the other states engagement in this process engagement in offshore wind, I mean, that's pretty key. And to, to, to Don's point, I don't think New Hampshire, um, I mean, they've been pretty transparent actually in some ways about their um, interest in some of the economic benefits, Massachusetts obviously moving pretty aggressively. So maybe it's already out there clearly. Selena and Dan could probably give us a better understanding, but I, I do think that does, um, it, it it would be helpful, I think, for this group to better understand the public activities and, and some of the other interests of the states, and because and, I do think they are, they're important for me. Thanks, Hannah. Selena? That's a, that's a good point, and I think we can certainly do that. Um, the states have started to have conversations leading up to the task force meeting. And I, I personally think we're having uh, you know, great dialogue between the three states in terms of um, how to do this process, how to be transparent, how to make sure that um, stakeholders in individual states have information and kind of, um, kind of feed together. And so that is something that we're actively working on. I'd also say that as you saw through Dan's presentation, um, just on the lease stipulations alone, um, we do hear from Boehm an interest in um, improving the, the kind of stakeholder uh, transparency piece, as well as the, you're seeing more detailed lease stipulations. And so I think that this is an evolving process with this administration and there's ability to do um, shape it in a way that works best for the Gulf of Maine collectively as, as the three states. But we can certainly, to Hannah's point, bring some information back as we solidify plans across the three states. Super, okay. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks everyone um, for that. And, and please do reach out to Selena and others if you have questions about what's going on with the bone process. This is a moving, you know, it's happening now, right? As Selena says, tentative meeting in May. So things are going on. Okay. So let's, let's wrap up our meeting just with a couple um, next steps, clarifications. One is we have a date for our in-person Cundies Harbor meeting that we've mentioned a bunch of times, May 25th. We don't have exact timing, but we'd ask all of you to please block your calendars to head down uh, to, to Cundies Harbor um, for an in-person meeting. Uh, the core of that meeting will be about listening um, and understanding um, uh, fisheries realities in lived experience um, and building on that presentation that Ben Martens gave us in our last meeting. So May 25th, um, and that organization is happening uh, right now, Meredith and Terry and, and everybody, um, and Patrice has, has uh, offered to help too. So um, secondly, we're, go we're gonna have one or two short, say one hour webinars between now and July. Um, so that we're just up to date, we, we don't lose track of each other. And in July, in your calendars is a meeting and we're gonna try, you know, COVID permitting, again, to be in person um, and do a significant meeting in person, uh, maybe a half day or something like that, um, to really wrestle with what these recommendations are telling us and what this means for a roadmap and how we wanna really provide the best advice we can to GEO on that. So. Heads up for that July meeting. Mark it in your calendars is probably in person um, and we look forward to seeing you there. The last thing I'll say is, um, as you all know, this has been a period in March and now into April of what we've been calling proactive stakeholder engagement around the draft initial recommendations. 
Um, and it's been happening and will continue to happen. Um, and Laura can help remind me of all the pieces this, that have happened already. We've already done an event with the Friends of Casco Bay, um, with Paul Anderson's group, um, and uh, an initial conversation uh, that uh, with the Maine Municipal Association that Neil helped put together and probably some follow-up to that. Um, and some initial conversations with uh, tribal historic preservation folks um, and a few other things that have happened. And next month, expect um, conversations with Maine conservation voters. Um, we're trying to work something with uh, Ben Lucas uh, and, and Matt um, with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and there's a handful of other working around doing one with Youth Voices and uh, also working around issues of low-income communities uh, and communities of color on some of the equity questions. Uh, so those are all activities that are ongoing um, and it's happening. And so if you have some thoughts and ideas for us, we welcome you to reach out. Laura, did I miss something uh, important in that overview? I think you covered the bulk of it. I just did put in the, um... In the chat, you know, we are encouraging people to really look through the working group recommendations. There's a uh, uh, on the website. There's a feedback form, um, and that's really a great opportunity for at this stage for people to really who are observing the process or even involved and want to see what the other working groups are, are doing in more depth and provide feedback. Uh, we really are, are looking for that at this point. And our web people say that traffic is up significantly, like by exponentially, on the website. And yet we're not getting a ton of clicks on actually going through into the feedback. So if you have networks that you can continue to tap and send them that link um, and say, it's really a great opportunity now to get into that feedback page, uh, we'd welcome that. Okay, we're a few minutes over. Um, anything else from co-chairs, from Selena, Stephanie, Laura, anybody else um, before we finish up? David, can you just clarify what date is the July meeting for the advisory committee? Is that the 22nd? Uh, it's in my calendar. Let's look. <laughs> uh, I have the same question. Yours. If it's not, if it's, not uh, it's the uh, 20th. 20th. Wednesday, July 20th. Wednesday, July um, 20th. So our two big in-person dates are May 25th and Wednesday, July 20th. And we had said, you know, in between we may... Um, uh, have some, an, another, you know, hourly uh, update um, and maybe an opportunity, uh, Selena, as you offer to do something about where Mass New Hampshire are, maybe after the um, after the BOA, meet, BOA meeting and before our July meeting might be a good time to bring people back together for another quick update if, if that works. Yeah. Great. Okay. I think that's it. Um... Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for your time this morning. Uh, as you can see, an enormous amount of work happening. Take care. We'll be in touch. Stay tuned. Um, and thanks. All the best. Feel free to reach out to me, Selena, anybody. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Terry, let me know how this light off goes. I will. We'll see. Hopefully it will today, uh, this week. I hope. I got some fish to